Welcome to the fourth and final episode of Unpacking the Beat Poets on Poetry LA. Uh, we're going to talk about what happened after the beat generation. It didn't really die. If you wanted to break it down decade by decade, there was the decade of 1944, 1954, 1954, 1964, 1964, 1974. And so we'll start with 1974. Jack Kerouac had died but all the other guys and women were still alive. And it was in 1974 that Allen Ginsberg and Ann Waldman got together and formed the Kerouac School of Disembodied Poetics at Naropa Institute in Boulder, Colorado. I deliberately left Ann Waldman out of uh, Women in the Beats because she is a sort of a bridge and I'm going to talk about Ann uh, in this episode because she is very significant in not only uh, keeping the beat ethos alive and beat poetics going, but in uh, telling and uh, in, in basically awakening new generations of people to uh, beat poetry through her through anthologies that she has edited and through her own work, her directorship of the Poetry Project in New York City, and her continuing publication and teaching. I am the Guard by Ann Waldman. The razor incut of void meat Buddha. Dear Jack Kerouac, who'd rather die than be famous, who ran away from college in 1941 into the memorial cello time and split his gut, 50 pesos, Aztec blues, a vast cavern, eh? I caught he did a cold from the sun, upside down language, ulta bumsi, brihak, brop, of the cloud mopped afternoon and turned this lady upside down, dayur aham priviti tham, May Vishnu prepare the womb. May Tsavar fashion the forms. May Prajapati cause the seed to flow. May Datar place the seed within thee. Let the marriage begin. Let the fucking begin to people our numbers. What's it about the fucking? What's it about to become a form to worry about fucking? And we are dying in it, of it, inside the form, which is happy illusions, mind bog, any hoop. But you can go. Go now, go now, in spite of your blickety blickety hanes. But keep me, whatever your name is, deity, a terrible form, a croda murti. Keep me terrible, for I curse the day I wed the poets. For I have sinned. I have slept in the arms of another husband. I have advocated revolution in the marketplace. I have looked in the face of Fidel Castro. Only the laboring man adds anything to society and wept, but see how he is lost in his gray beard and fuzzy thoughts? Fidel now, I am old now. The father is speaking now, and of Kerouac, his indulgent boy word run, sometimes hard to keep company with. Slowly, fully clothed, lying on his bed of thorns, my father, room shuttered, she goes to pull the light in. I have nothing to live for, no direction, no directions to go, came here to die. I am waiting to die. I'd rather die than be famous. I never thought I would live it this long. As you can see, she incorporates language poetry. Uh, some of these words are just meaning, meaningless syllables that um, Kerouac, probably referencing his uh, Old Angel Midnight, where he has an, a lot of invented uh, words just for the sound of it, or his long poem, C, which he, he goes swish, swash. Flushu, fallopian, stardust tones, things like that. And so she picked up on that and incorporated that into her poem. And of course, Anne Waldman's work is vast. Um, she probably has close to 40 publications out there, and they're all worth looking into. I mean, one that I really like is Skin Meat Bones, which I think is probably just, just right for somebody getting into Anne Waldman for the first time. Now, I talked about this being 1974, and shortly thereafter, uh, a new counterculture developed in, initially in England uh, during the Thatcher era, and the Thatcher era coincided with the Reagan era in the United States, with the onset of cutting away of the social safety net, 
the rise of the new right, the notion of personal responsibility ideology, and it generated a new counterculture that initially expressed itself in music, um, or most, pr most predominantly in music. But there were two, two figures who later emerged as musicians who started writing poetry, Patti Smith and Jim Carroll. Both are much more well known for their music than for their poetry, although their poetry is all in print and it is still being bought and sold. I'm going to start with a poem by Jim Carroll. I stand here. I stand here watching all the lost angels wash the feet of fools, sharing their lies better than bread. I stand here in shadows of two towers gone, waiting some hundred odd years for the dream of a bulletproof king. I stand here rusting on this rock, sinking in this harbor, trapping hopes in snapshot postcards. Perhaps you've been inside me, parted the copper and slowly worked your way up my robe, searching for my promise and a little taste of America. Perhaps you've climbed into my mind, starry-eyed me, red-capped me, tied me up and wrapped me in flags and patriot grins. Perhaps you've misunderstood me as some antebellum girl shackled on this island. But scratch my pale patina skin, I'm brown as Lincoln's coin. We stand here in gray water, our torch out with the tide. We won't see where we're going, a colossus of failed destiny. We kneel here, demanding that you care. We're tired, we're poor, and we can't breathe. This is a punk poem, and at the same time, it is a poem full of myth mythological illusions. Again, going back to the original beats who were perceived by uh, the mass media of the time as unwashed, ignorant, know-nothings. The same was thought of, of, of punks, too. They don't know anything. They are good for nothing and destructive. Well, you know, we have a poem here that is not destructive, but that is good for something. And that is um, extremely erudite. Uh, Jim Carroll began writing when he was, I think, 13 or 14 years old. And Kerouac saw some of his writing at that time shown to him by Ted Berrigan, and he was impressed with it. And he, he said, you know, this is beautiful original writing. So, you know, Berrigan told that to Jim Carroll and that inspired him to go on. Uh, one of his books is called Living at the Movies. It's probably the best collection to start with on Jim Carroll. And the other poet is Patti Smith, who's got several books of poetry. She's also a prose writer and she's still writing. The Sheep Lady from Algiers. Nodding though the lamps lit low, Nodding for passers underground, to and fro, she's darning, and the yarn is weeping, red and pale, marking the train stops from Algiers, sleeping though the eyes are pale, hums in rhythm with a bonnet on, lullaby a broken song, the shifting cloth is bleeding red, weeping yarn from Algiers, lullaby though baby's gone, the cradle rocks a barren song. She's rocking with her ribbons on. She's rocking yarn and needles. Oh, it's long coming from Algiers. That is a ballad. And going back to Helen Adam, who we started with in the last episode as a precursor of the women beats. So we're sort of coming around to this, but the subject matter is something that she has witnessed. She didn't, uh, uh, Patti Smith did make a trip to Al Algiers and she noted this and it comes out as a poem that's been worked over, made into something that is beyond, that starts with her personal experience and then is out there. It is emotion objectified once again. Oh, Raphael, guardian angel, in love and crime, all things move in sevens. Seven compartments in the heart, the seven elaborate temptations, seven devils cast from Mary Magdalene whore of Christ, the seven marvelous voyages of Sinbad, Sinbad, and the number seven branded forever on the forehead of Cain, the first inspired man, the father of desire and murder. But his was not the first ecstasy. Consider his mother. Eve's was the crime of curiosity, as the saying goes, it killed the pussy. One bad apple spoiled the whole shot. But be sure it was no apple, 
An apple looks like an ass. It's fag's fruit. It must have been a tomato, or better yet, a mango. She bit. Must we blame her, abuse her, poor sweet bitch? Perhaps there's more to the story. Think of Satan as some stud. Maybe her knees were open. Satan snakes between them. They open wider, snakes up her thighs, rubs against her for a while, more than the tree of knowledge was about to be eaten. She shudders her first shudder. Pleasure, pleasure garden. Was she sorry? Are we ever girls? Was she a good lay? God only knows. And there we have all of the unconventional, the transgressive in a single poem, starting with the letter seven and spinning off from that into her retelling of the story of the Garden of Eden from a feminist perspective. Um, that is, that's another way that, that the beat lives on. And I'd like to talk about some other poets who do not have the reputation of Patti Smith but are nonetheless part of that uh, punk underground or who emerged from that punk underground. And I will start with Iris Berry, who now is poet, publisher, and editor. Take it away, Iris. It's the earthquake weather in me. It's my love for palm trees and the way they line certain streets. My love for supermarkets with their big empty parking lots. It's taking long drives through various canyons. It's being in love with certain silhouettes and views of trees and telephone poles as the sun is setting because I've seen them all my life and they're embedded in my soul. It's having love for certain streets because they have no sidewalks. It's my ability to love the ocean only through a restaurant window, but disliking it with its direct sun if asked to lay in it, scantily clad for more than two minutes. It's my love for the stars, the ones in the sky and on sidewalks. It's growing up with an empty backyard and having to drive far to visit friends and family. It's only knowing the changing seasons by what's on display on the shelves at the supermarkets. It's having to drive everywhere just to get anywhere. It's being bummed when it rains, even though there's a drought. It's talking on the phone with friends more than seeing them in person. It's my love for the beach, but rarely seeing it. It's being guilty of saying, it's hot, but it's a dry heat. It's refusing to go somewhere because I probably won't find a place to park, and yet there's parking lots everywhere. It's all the famous streets and boulevards with their incredible history. It's many different cultures and subcultures and cults. It's the place where people come to be somebody. It's definitely a love-hate thing. Sometimes it's like the greatest drug and the best place on earth. And other times it's like telling someone you love them and they don't say it back. But it's my home. I was born here. I can't imagine living anywhere else. I can't imagine leaving Los Angeles. Here is a poem that is grounded in uh, daily reality, daily life, a specific place and time and at the same time, a poem of universality, a poem drawn from her own experiences, uh, a poem uh, about Los Angeles at a specific period, but nonetheless that resonates today with us. And that is, again, do it yourself. Uh, that was one of the, that was the ethos of uh, punk that, that actually had an origin in, in, in the beat generation. But DYI, do it yourself, teach yourself to write poetry by reading other poets, by establishing a connection with the lineage that inspires you, and, and that's what's happening here. Another poet is Julie Rogers. Julie Rogers uh, has a direct connection. She is the widow of the late David Meltzer. She was writing poetry before she met Meltzer. Her poetry, again, is a poetry of the beast, and at the same time, it is a poetry that connects with um, the woman's voice. The politics of going along anyway. Politics, 5A. The total complex relations between people living in society. Merriam-Webster. That kid cries like I'd cry if clenched in mother's hand, dragged to the crosswalk, made to stay between the lines, wide mouth grimace, heaving screams into the street, curling shreds of no! Not one more step forced into the next. It's not my way. Yelling down a windpipe stuck in the dark, kicking at air, at thoughts going nowhere, near the way things are, gulping a voice unheard, spitting tears into an abyss, 
because you don't want to do this. Hen house. The mother is never done. Her hands work, her heart Play-Doh shapes. The mold cuts her to size. She looks in the mirror of her child's eyes. She stares back. She holds a bottle, a receiver, a broom, remembers not knowing what to do, but she never stops talking, her voice an alarm clock, bullhorn, lullaby, crackling long distance, muttering under her breath quick prayers, hopes, like great clouds on the horizon. She tells herself to let go, all birds fly. She cleans and cleans the nest, its emptiness, its clutter of songs. She learns to sing a new tune. She's off key, but carries on late at night when the other hens are quiet. This is a poem about a child leaving home. And it is one of those quotidian things that previously was not considered suitable for poetry. It's just too mundane. But nonetheless, it is, it is an experience of parental loss, of parental separation. And it is told in ordinary simple details, um, de details from daily life, and the emotion that is crammed into that, and all of the behavior that a mother has uh, in concern with her child. In this case, it was uh, Julie's daughter. This is an example of the women beats bringing a woman's experience and valorizing that experience into poetry. Nika Ray, who has had more than one collection of poems, but this is her current one. She is also somebody from the punk movement. Again the Fog, the Fog Again by Nika Ray. I gotta get home to the harbor town, boat horns at night. The sunken city sidewalks fenced off for safety, weekly earthquakes rearranging roads. I'm driving near the water. The fog is rolling in. I caught a glimpse of your headlights before the fog rolled in, blinded. You're not coming home again. I'm waiting for the phone call telling me you're dead. I'm waiting for the boat horn to wake me up from here. I'm driving near the water, looking for you near. I'm waiting for the phone call, the ringing in my ear. I gotta get home this morning, before you melt the spoon. I see your headlights coming, the fog is rolling in. I am reaching out for you before your phone goes dead. The boat horns are sounding, filling me with dread. Thick by Nika Ray. My head is thick with rain, or is it the pitter-patter on the windowsill fogging my brain? Just give me one more pill, that'll do the trick, fogging my brain. Too many dishes in the sink. The sponge is old and ick. My head is thick with rain. No more money in the till. I'm on the brink. My head is thick with rain. My slippers are fuzzy and pink. I light another cigarette, fogging my brain. If I could have a dog to pet, I could pour the pills and cigarettes down the drain. My head is thick with rain, fogging my brain. This is another poem that brings in rhyme in, in, in a refreshing way, both poems did, and it's drawn from uh, Nika's life, from certain experiences that she had during her punk days, which are behind her now, but um, she is another poet that is continuing uh, this beat tradition, uh, again writing about her own life, writing about what is important to her, and writing in a way that the words are able to communicate what she is feeling to what she, to what you could feel, uh, allowing yourself to open to what those words are saying. Another local poet is Pam Ward. Now, Pam Ward is generally not associated with a, a, a continuation of the beats, but in fact she is because she emphasizes that musical element in the beats. And, uh, of course, we didn't talk about the African-American beat poets, Ted Jones, uh, Amiri Baraka, and Bob Kaufman. Those poets cons were a solid tradition within the beat poets. And, uh, and in the case of Ted Jones and uh, Bob Kaufman, crossovers into surrealism. So I'm going to read one poem by Pam Ward. Hollywood Hills. Every time I went over Kim's, her dad came outside while we laid next to the pool. 
It was a small, useless tank with horrible swamp green water, where bugs hatched their eggs in the scum. Her dad would always come out there, checking the pump, fiddling with the gauges, sticking his wrist in the deep end. Kim leaned over and told me that they were all in therapy now, ever since he fucked one of her friends. I watched him duck in the garage and emerge later, shot glass red, a Jim Beam smirk on his face. He wades in and wet covers his thighs, hips, and gut, ballooning vulgarly beneath his shorts. His grin made me think of a zipper half down, a man whistling at kids while hosing his grass. My hairdresser begging me to suck it, right there in the chair, and I know what's out there happening in Hollywood or Watts or Marina Del Rey. Every day there's a hand with a fistful of candy, a wet, hungry tongue resting over chapped lips, a fist waiting to scrawl your name on the wall, an arm luring you down underwater. Here is a personal poem that is, that is generalized into something that women have to cope with and deal with, uh, something that is stark and at the same time it Pam's all of Pam's poetry has a certain rhythm to it it's the melopoeia is always working for her and of course her delivery is so much better than mine um, and again this is a, a part of that continuity of of the beat literary movement because it is bringing in the personal as poetical it is addressing something that is more than personal, something that is common, that is not spoken about, and it's done so in a language that you can grasp and that you can take in, and something that is immediate. And at the same time, uh, it, it, it grabs you by the throat. Another poet that comes from the punk tradition, or out of that tradition, is Puma Pearl who also works with uh, music now. This is her fifth book, Birthdays Before and After. All of her other books are still in print and she is another poet worth seeking out, solidly within this beat lineage. And she works with uh, musicians, although she doesn't sing her poem, she is backed by wonderful musicians that uh, perfectly match her work. Unlocked by Puma Pearl. All of my stories have been told I write new ones every morning. Yours was the last before I resigned, cashed the check at Bayland. Did you see the New York moon before it, the gate slammed down? Do you still stand by your bed listening, television humming, foot tapping, the scent of pineapple and ginger drifting tentatively through the window? Or was it my scent and yours mingling, sweet rage unleashed, entangled? My hands lay open as I sleep, alone, dreamless, fucked into invisibility, freed by indifference, my body little more than a life support system. Again, balanced on the borderline, we miss the high bars. The love cops locked up the playground. Other poets who are part of this beat lineage and solidly identify with it, uh, one is Mark Olmsted, um, who, was, uh, who studied with Ginsburg and had a correspondence with him that was published in a book. I'm going to read just one poem of Marx from his chapbook, Cemetery Manners, and it is the title poem. Cemetery Manners. The degenerate age is a mad king for president, a Buddhist kingdom allowing genocide, a thrill across the Europe planet of Nazi chic, once LSD and Karl Marx, a Tibet that will never be free, and the turquoise lake a stain, endless war, stirring hornets to fight hornets, super rich in bunkers, and poets no longer read in the Twitter feed of static mind, in the Kali Yuga showroom, in cemetery manners, setting the table of love. You can see the, the beat uh, sensibility at work here, the juxtaposition of desperate elements, um, the degenerate age is a mad king for president. I think we know when this was written, what, what administration he's talking about. Um, a Buddhist kingdom allowing genocide. Um, the Europe planet for Nazi chic. Um, it's all there. It's a, it's a topical poem, and at the same time, it's a poem that references history. I'd like to sort of tie the whole series together with this poem uh, by S.A. Griffin. 
from his collection Pandemic Soul Music, uh, his latest, published by Punk Hostage Press. Can't Stop the Beat by S.A. Griffin for Ruth Weiss, 1928-2020. Stream of consciousness is how these things happen. Berlin, beat poets since five, living bohemian love language of North Beach, moving picture of a poet on the brink, breaking the rules before the word, influential dreamer in full bloom, last of her line nerve breaker coming home. You have to drink and dance a lot, laugh alive on an old typewriter with green hair, play a lot with words in one's own voice, firmly rooted in its center. A black jazz fool's journey with big redwoods deep inside. This jazz and poetry, this connection with the unbelievable, these stories in brilliant short time. An idea that you have no idea to improvise divine haiku into morning. Impossible music always about to start. A hummingbird that never leaves the heart. That is a sort of a full circle of, um, of the beat poetry movement down to the present. And very recently, uh, a wonderful anthology called Beat Not Beat has been published last year by Moontide Press. And it gathers poets that are beat and poets that are not beat. Among the authors are poets who are from that original generation of the beats and poets who have followed in their footsteps and lineages. So, and I say lineages because there is more than one within, within, within the beat literary movement itself, but all working within that umbrella, all sharing a certain common ancestry and a certain common poetic. So I hope that uh, these four programs, Unpacking the Beat Poets, has awakened your interest and shed a little light on what the beats were and still are all about. Thanks for listening. Thank you.